is Janice Law, and I'm the founder of American Women Writers National Museum. And this is our great videographer, Christian Kukal. Thank you. Uh, who won an Emmy, who has won an Emmy, so he's an wow. Emmy Award winning uh, videographer. Uh, women buy 70% of the books sold in America. Ooh, yes. Yes. I can believe that. So all the women are going, yes, yes. <laughs> by 70% of the books sold in America, yet there was no national museum to honor our great American women writers, historical and contemporary. So two years ago, I founded the museum in Washington, D.C. We don't have a building yet, because we're just still a startup, but we meet in rented space here at the National Press Club, where I am a member. So we're very, very grateful to the National Press Club for providing us for free uh, this very, very nice space. And also, we have something called, I started something called the 50 State Project. Every month, ONAM, which is the acronym for our museum, honors women writers from four different states. If you look at our website, we've already recorded the programs where excerpts are read from these fabulous women's writing. But uh, each month, we again acknowledge them, and this month, we're acknowledging women writers from Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. It's obviously in alphabetical order. So I want to begin. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, person from the Library of Congress to make a brief presentation before our regular presentation. But I do want to introduce a couple of people in the audience uh, who are also very, very distinguished and have graced us with their presence today and you should know them. One of them is Jennifer Gavin. Jennifer, could you stand up, please? And she, you know the National Book Festival that's down here oh, yeah. for two days, which is an institution. Uh, Jennifer Gavin is in charge of the whole thing, the project. And we just met uh, on Monday night, and we discovered that both of us at one time uh, we're in the bureaus covering the Florida legislature, of all things. <laughs> that amazing coincidence. And her associate with her is Audrey Fisher. Audrey, would you, Ms. Fisher, would you stand up? And she is the, she is the editor of the Library of Congress magazine, which is called LCM for Library of Congress magazine. <laughs> so uh, we very much appreciate having them today. Uh, Rosemary. Clackus is going to speak to us first, yes. and then I'm going to introduce our main speakers. Rosemary Placas is curator of rare books at the Library of Congress, and she's a very, very humble and modest person, but I will tell you what she won't tell you, she's one of the most foremost authorities in America on rare books. Ooh. Obviously, she would not be at the Library of Congress in her position. See, she's shaking her head, uh, but I know she is. And the Library of Congress has a considerable collection of books on Emily Dickinson. So she's going to take about five or eight minutes and just speak to us about the Library of Congress's collection before we have our main speaker, who graciously agreed to give up a part of their time. She's going to pass around some uh, things for you to look at, too, I think. She should put me last. <laughs> so, Rosemary Plankins, thank you. Oh, thank you, Janice. of my role at the library. But, um, I'm coming here on behalf of another uh, longtime friend and colleague at the library, um, Barbara Daesh, who is a senior robot cataloger. And um, she wasn't feeling well today, and so I said, okay, I will make the presentation, even though she would do a much better job than, than I could, could do. Um, I just <coughs> brought two well, I passed out a, a description of the two uh, books that I'm going to talk about. Um, one is the uh, 1890 edition of the poems, which was the first published edition of Emily's poems that were done by her friends, um, Alice Lewis Todd and, uh, and uh, Tigginson, uh, Thomas, Thomas, Thomas Wentworth Tigginson, who, who was 
says in the preface that he only saw her directly and face to face twice, but he had carried on a correspondence with her for a long time. And uh, anyway, they published a series, three different publications in the ten years, a decade after her death, they published three different books that were collections, selected collections of her poems. And this is the cover, the first one, and it includes uh, the cover art um, that was uh, based on a painting by, um, by Mrs. Todd um, of what they call Indian pipes. And the authorities here can probably give you more information about that. But the, it was used on all three of those first editions, but in different, with a different cloth backing green on the other two and, and um, gold um, impressions on the flowers rather than the silver that was on the first edition. And the other item that I want to talk a little bit about um, is a more recent construction, in fact simile, of, um, of a work by, uh, by Emily. And as I note in the, the caption that I described there, it shows how enduring her popularity was up into uh, the 20th and 20th century and beyond. And these two books I selected to be part of an exhibit that I was partially responsible for uh, last year called Books That Checked America. And so we had the first edition and the edition that I'm going to describe now. And I'm going to take just a few minutes to read a paragraph uh, that my friend uh, Barbara Dash wrote because I think it'll take less time than if I <laughs> talked about it. She says there's a, an old tradition gaining increasing attention in the last few years in Spain, Portugal, and Latin America. It's called the lit Literatura del Cordel, or if you will, clothesline literature. The name describes the practice of hanging small handmade books from clotheslines in a public square. In, in 1985, a somewhat independent press was founded in an old seaside town of Matanza, Cuba, to produce handmade books in this tradition and editions, in editions of no more than 200 copies. The name of the press is Abiconis Bahia, which means the Watchtower of Publishers. And almost every one of their works has a little picture of a light um, somewhere in their um, presentation. Founded by a poet and a talented graphic designer, the press attracted young volunteers who contributed their poetry, historical research, art, labor, and labor. They volunteered mostly. Um, at the beginning, they, did, they had an old mimeograph um, machine and they reproduced their text. <coughs> Staff would sit around the table, complete their little books, assembly line fashion, decorating them with uh, found materials. Uh, paper cutouts water, with watercolors, with twigs and leaves from the bushes in the square below, um, and with uh, sand from the nearby beach. Most of the books were tied with yarn, string, or, or other kinds of cord uh, to be hung, which was part of the tradition of that literature of the, uh, uh, of the clothesline. Well, one of the founders has been quoted as saying that the Bahia Press was a reaction against the draft government publications that dominated Cuba and the Cuban publishing and that excluded uh, some of these sectors of society. And so the Bahia not only has given voice to aspiring Cuban artists, but has put into circulation excerpts from world literature, ethnic history and music, religious expressions, and personal testimonies of support of women's rights. And in this collection, we have about 200 of those works, a little over 200, that have been published in this period since, uh, since 1985. And they include a lot of, of women writers, artists, and books about women. So there might be something that you would be interested in as a subject of, of a presentation later on sometime. And so with, I, I just brought up some color illustrations that I will pass around that you can look at from this publication. And since this was in the Books That Shaped America, you can actually find a color copy of this uh, creation, uh, construction it's called, um, online. But I'll pass this around. This shows how they, the artists of this press envisioned it 
to be presented, and the book, which is a selection of Emily Dickinson's poems based on the 1960 edition, um, would be reproduced and would be housed in this house, which is supposed to rep represent her house in, in Amherst. And you can see it has a tree and a, um, a moon and stars and uh, a, 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 her and uh, her name is hanging on right below the, uh, the, the top of the roof. So that's what it looks when it's constructed. And then I thought you'd be interested in seeing what the, our wonderful conservation people can do. And this is the way all of these, the books from this press are housed, so that they're in very good condition. Um, this, it, the, the Emily Dickinson book takes up two layers of, like, four layers in a, in a box. And this gives you another close idea of the publication and the, the rest of the stuff that they would use to make this three-dimensional uh, so that it's in two different layers as it's presented in the conservation box. And here's the house and the roof, which are separate. And then a um, little bit a closer up of her house with her image. And you can see this the lace on her around her neck is real lace that's on every book. Now the book itself, this is the title page of the book itself, and the, these, the mimeograph was made using a drawing uh, by the artist, and this, the next one uh, actually shows who, who the artists were of this particular book. And lastly, I opened to a page that uh, includes Emily's poem, Silence. <coughs> Silence is all we dread. There's ransom in the voice, but silence is infinity himself, have not faith. So that is, is the book in the, from the Cuban Press um, Artist Book Collection. And uh, if you are interested in either one of these books or, or this collection, I would welcome you to come to the Red Book Room at the Library of Congress and you can look through these books yourself at any time that uh, you'd like to come to the library. Thank you very much. Rosemary, can you stay around yes. afterwards if people want to ask you a question? Sure. I don't know about the rare books. Sure. So Rosemary will stay around after. You can uh, ask her some questions. Since we're discussing, um, oh, uh, I want to thank the Washington Post. Where they almost always use our announcements, but mm. last Sunday they used a special announcement next to the literary calendar and next to the bestseller list. So they've done that three times for our humble little startup. So I appreciate <laughs> that very much. That's great. Yeah. Um, I thought we should uh, mention something about who Emily Dickinson is, just in case everybody here doesn't know. But this videotape does go, if centers from the book and states want a copy of it, I give them a copy. So it goes to people who uh, might not know. Emily Dickinson was born in 1830 and she died in 1886. She was born in Amherst, Massachusetts, and spent most of her life as a recluse, or virtual recluse, in her Amherst home, which is now a museum. Her known literary work includes about 1,800 poems. Before I introduce our great speakers, I want to just read something on Emily from the New York Times in August of this year. It was uh, written by a man named Holland Cotter. If you fall for Emily Dickinson early, you're committed to language for life and almost unavoidably to Dickinson's kind of language. It's more concrete than just words on a page or in the air. It's language as a physical material, a substance so concentrated that you can all but hold it in your hands, turn it over, feel its textures. And it's addictive. Once it's in your system, it's impossible to shape like a neurological imprint. Dickinson's language was visual, startling, flashbulb way, a bang of illumination, after which your vision <coughs> took time to adjust to normal light. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful for Mr. Cotter. So our speakers today are... Uh, Martha Nell Smith, who's on my right in this sort of wine-colored jacket, and uh, 
Martha Nell Smith was one of the founders, a founding board member of the Emily Dickinson International Society. She's a University of Maryland English professor, where she serves as chair of the university's senate. Smith's honors pack a single-spaced page, including a Rutgers University Distinguished Alumni Award in 2009, the highest honor Rutgers bestows on its former students. She is a recipient of numerous awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Mellon Foundation. <clears throat> Nellie Lambert, our other speaker this morning, is wearing a sort of dark jacket next, uh, next to Martha. And uh, Nellie Lambert grew up in Paris, Haiti, and Washington, D.C. That's such an interesting combination. <laughs> and she's a newer Dix Dickinson scholar. She just obtained her doctorate from Catholic University of America and has already made a big splash in Dickinson scholarship circles. She serves as secretary of the local D.C. area Emily Dickinson Society. She holds a bachelor's from the University of Chicago, an M.A. in English Literature and Film from Georgetown University, and is completing a degree in philosophy and great books at St. John's College. So as you can see, these are very, very distinguished uh, women. And when I first heard about the topic, we were trying to decide what to talk about with Emily Dickinson. And Nellie said to me, well, do you know I'm writing about humor and Emily Dickinson? And I thought, Emily Dickinson wrote about suicide and death. So what could be funny? But anyway, uh, anyway, that's why today's lecture is unique. And they're going to answer that question. And we're going to lead off with uh, Martha, Martha Nell Smith. Would you please welcome Martha Nell? Well, thank you very much. It's a lovely introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you all for giving me your lunch hour, giving us your lunch hour. Um, I did not grow up someplace so exotic as Paris. I grew up in San Angelo, Texas. So I believe that y'all is the plural. <laughs> we can argue about it after the talk if you have a difference. There's a Paris, Texas. I know there's a Paris, Texas. Um, I thought that I would tell you a little bit about my walk with Emily Dickinson and uh, why I ended up with two of my colleagues writing a book called Comic Power in Emily Dickinson. Um, I was really glad that you were showing Emily Dickinson being recycled, responded to artistically, etc. I don't know if there's anyone else in the room who likes to watch trash TV, but I sometimes, when I need to just chill, um, and you know, Emily Dickinson, since 2011, has been featured on 30 Rock. <laughs> Tina Fey names her cat, Emily Dickinson, because she's decided she's not going to date anymore. <laughs> um, she was on the second to the last episode of Breaking Bad. Some neo-Nazi guy. I'm not a Breaking Bad fan, but I, I just haven't had time to watch it. Um, and some... Come on in. <laughs> no problem. Um, and she uh, was on a very recent episode of Bones, where one Dickinson scholar has to kill a Library of Congress <laughs> librarian. Oh. Yes. Because, Glenn Scene, I can see the head shaking back there, because the librarian discovered a letter that disproves the scholar's thesis about the reason that Emily Dickinson wrote all her poems. And according to the scholar, it's because Emily Dickinson was a virgin. And so she was writing her part and other parts of her body out, evidently, in the poetry. But what the, the librarian had discovered were love letters from Emily that are obviously alluding to very intimate physical contact. Anyway, that's Did you a, succeed? 
Did she succeed the librarian? No. Did the scholar succeed in killing the librarian? She did. <laughs> That's why it's a Bones episode. <laughs> it's, you should watch it. It's actually quite entertaining. <laughs> the 30 Rock is very funny. Um, I believe the cat Emily Dickinson jumped out the window. Anyway, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, anyway, it was years before I had been reading Emily Dickinson four years before I ever read a book of criticism or a biography of her. So I didn't know that she wasn't funny. And I started to read some biographers and critics and I said, who are these people reading? <laughs> I've been the way I started reading her was I told you I was from Texas. I'm the youngest in my family by a long shot. And I was visiting my brother and sister-in-law, and I got in trouble for something. I cannot remember what. Doesn't matter. And I was told I had to go spend the rest of the weekend by my mother. I had to spend the rest of the weekend in the bedroom at my brother and sister's. So I go to my brother's bookshelves, and I see this complete poems of Emily Dickinson. I said, oh, I kind of liked her. Yeah, I'd memorize some of her poems. So I grab the book, and it completely pulls me in and swallows me up. And I stole that book <laughs> from my brother. And I did return it to him uh, when we were congregating after my dear mom passed three years ago at the age of night. She said, Honey, you really should give that book. <laughs> you have a lot of Emily Dickinson on your show. Anyway, I did not realize that Dickinson wasn't funny. I didn't realize that she wasn't powerful. Some of the work I'm doing right now is actually disproving the reclusion thesis. Uh, I've kind of made my career, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, off of reading Emily's mail. I love to read other people's mail. I can't stand it when someone reads my mail. Um, but, uh, and her sister, now I'm reading her sister-in-law Susan Dickinson's mail, because Susan Dickinson received more poems and letters from Emily Dickinson than anybody else according to the present record. And by more, I don't mean 10 more, or 20 more, or 50 more. I mean, the next most frequently addressed correspondent is Thomas Higginson, and more than twice as many poems or letters than she sent him. Really almost three times as much. So I'm very interested in the sister-in-law, and now I'm reading her mail. <laughs> And she took care of Dickinson in the last year or so of Dickinson's life. And she casually alludes to people going to see her. And that was, I was not expecting to find that when I went to these letters. So, anyway. But we're not here to talk about all that. We're here to talk about Dickinson and comedy. I decided to share with you, uh, because I do work with Dickinson's manuscripts, and you can go to emilydickinson.org to see these in color and to see these much more vividly than the handouts that you have in front of you. And you'll see when you go to emilydickinson.org, there's a menu scrolling across the bottom. And you want to go to the oldest section of the site. You'll see if you look at the URL down in the uh, left hand corner, it says archive.emilydickinson.org. And you can go to an article there about Dickinson cartoonists. She drew little pictures in correspondence to her friends and family all the time. One of the few times, now it is true that she didn't travel much, and one of the few times that she came to, to or that she traveled, was coming to Washington, D.C. <coughs> when her father was serving in the U.S. Congress. And she stayed in the Willard Hotel, which did not look like it looks now. 
I guarantee you. Um, and one of the things, I don't think I had enough copies for everybody, but the one that's got the little drawing down in the corner, the little letter. Yeah. No, no, not that one. It's got a little, let's see. Here it is. There you go. There's not enough for everyone, and I'm sorry it's so small, but I thought I reproduced it in the size that this letter, these letters actually are, so you can get an idea of how some of the drawings appear. This is an 1851 letter to her brother, and if you see the little drawing down in the corner, it is, she didn't mind taking stationery that didn't belong to her. So she took some of her father's stationery, and on his congressional stationery, the U.S. Capitol was embossed. And so that little bitty drawing that you see is around that embossment of the U.S. Capitol. And if you look very, very closely, you'll see that there's a stick figure and that his hair is standing up on end as if he is flipping his wig. <laughs> and her father was, of course, a wig representative to <laughs> Congress. And he didn't like Congress very much. He complains constantly about Congress's dysfunction. So, nothing, there is nothing wow. new under the sun. Okay. Now, y'all tell me something. Tell me things that you know about Emily Dickinson. And it doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong. I'm trying to get at what is the idea of Emily Dickinson in society and culture. Yes? I read a novel about her. Aha! Uh -huh. I can't remember the name or the author. But she was a cut-up when she was young. She was quite a cut-up. Really, I mentioned this book to someone who was a Emily Dickinson scholar, as I remember, and she said, I said, well, was there anything truthful in the book? Well, her, her look of horror was so uh, <laughs> immense. I figured the whole book was just inaccurate. But you're suggesting that She was quite, when she was in Washington, remember I told yeah. you one of her visits was here? How old was she? She was, is it 1851, so she's 21, early 20s, and she's having dinner with a judge, and she turns to him and said, Your Honor, can one eat, and she's handing him a plum pudding, can one eat hellfire with impunity here? So she was always saying things. <laughs> and she had one love. Her love. One love, one major love. That's a very popular, and that's of course why she wrote her poems, right? Okay, yeah, that's good. Anything else you know about Emily Dickinson? When she would drop the basket down of her bedroom window for the kids down below, I thought that showed a different kind of personality. And what did that show to you? That she liked children, she liked to be playful. Yeah, she's very, very playful, and she's, you know, one of the things I tell my students and I tell my colleagues, is that if you're really serious, you cannot possibly get anything done unless you have a commitment to the importance of having fun. And I mean that. I really do. I don't think you can do things seriously if you're sober all the time. Anyway, so you get this playful side. Now this piece of paper, that has this drawing that, again, you can go to emilydickinson.org and you can see these much more vividly. This piece of paper is actually about this size, about the size of a business card, maybe a wee bit larger. And you can see that it was folded in quarters. And you can see that there's a little note on it. What that note says is, Dear Susie, I send you a little air, the music of the spheres. They are uh, denoted above as passing 
through the sky. Now, I knew about this note since the time I was an undergraduate. I saw it when I was first a graduate student. And keep in mind, it's little bit, little, little, little bit. And I would say to myself, self, <laughs> that is something about music of the spheres. You tell me. What, what, what came to mind? Any ideas? Pythagoras. I said, okay, that's a Pythagorean something or other. I have no idea. Yep. And I knew that Susan Dickinson, to whom this note was sent, was a math teacher in Baltimore. Now think of how rare that was. 1851, a woman teaching young men math and advanced math. Susan was one of those wicked, smart, very learned people. So I kept looking at this. This is in the Houghton Library of Harvard. And I'd ask to see it every time I'd visit. And I'd just sit there and go, I don't know. I don't know what this means. You know, I send you a little air. There's this little, that's a little musical staff. And, you know, there's the planets. So it's Pythagorean something, music of the spheres, blah, blah, blah. And then my second year teaching at the University of Maryland, I was teaching Moby Dick. And I was rereading the book. It's one of my favorite books. It is a long poem, you know. Don't believe anybody who tells you it's a novel. It's really a poem. Anyway. <laughs> and so I'm reading it, and I'm, you know, I'm a professor, so I need to read all of the footnotes, etc. And I come to a footnote that I did not remember having seen before, but it made me burst out laughing and made me think about this note. And it's in the early scene where they haven't even set sail yet. They're still in the little hotel or inn or whatever it is, and they're eating. And someone invokes to somebody else the Pythagorean maxim. Does anybody know what that was? Yeah, the C squared. Let me do the sides of the B squared plus B squared. The squared the two sides are equal to the square. That's the math part of it. But there was a slang term in New England in, about the Pythagorean maxim, and it was to avoid eating beans. So then I looked at this, and I said, this is a joke about flatulence. <laughs> Where one of my, I've co-authored a lot of books, and one of them, Open Me Carefully, Susan's, uh, Emily Dickinson's Intimate Letters to Susan Huntington Dickinson, co-authored with Ellen Louise Hart, and she didn't want to put that in there. We had a fight about it. And I said, well, if it doesn't go in, then I'm out of the book, period. So she said, whoa. And so I said, why don't you want to put this in there? I don't understand it. She said, and Ellen's kind of, you know Ellen, she's kind of, proper. She's very New England. Okay? And she said, because I can't imagine Emily Dickinson farting. <laughs> and I said, she lived and breathed, I guarantee you. <laughs> so you see her being playful with her sister-in-law there. The reason that little note is folded up like that is because they would fold up notes, put them in their household dresses and things, and pass them back and forth in the parlor. On the other side of this, and you can't see the text on it, but trust me that the text below these cutouts is a poem that says, a poor, torn heart, a tattered heart, that set it down to rest. Now, I knew that poem as a typographical poem, hadn't seen these cutouts, 
And many of my teachers had said, this is yet more documentation that Emily Dickinson got her heart broken, that she, you know, became reclusive, etc. This is a poem about her pining. And I thought, yeah, maybe. Because the poem is kind of, um, I would not call it a good poem. It's a very kind of juvenile, if you read it that way, it's a very juvenile kind of poem. So, but that's okay. I mean, you know, she wasn't always a woman. So, but again, I'm in the Houghton Library, and I'm getting my folders. You know, you go up to the desk, you get your folders, take them back to the table, and I open up this document, a poor torn heart, the tattered card. And actually, this piece is folded up and sort of pops out at me like a pop-up card. And what this is, is Emily Dickinson had gone into her father's copy of Charles Dickens' The Old Curiosity Shop. This is Little Nell. What happens to 19th century heroines, especially young ones? The damsels? They always die. <laughs> they always die. <coughs> well, this is Little Nell. And she is being comforted by her grandfather. You can see that they're in a cemetery. And this, at the bottom, is an illustration <coughs> of little Nell, having died, of course, being ferried up to heaven. Well, when you read the poem with those illustrations, a poor, <coughs> torn heart, tattered heart, and you think about the illustrations as commentary and play, it becomes a very different kind of text. So that's just a little bit in both comic power and online in Dickinson Cartoonist. You can see several other drawings. You can see several other cutouts. But she was not only a cutout, she liked to be a very active reader. You go to the Houghton Library, you go online, and you look to see images of her Bible. It is all cut up. And I'm serious. Like, the verses cut up, you know. And it's because she's a very active reader. She does regard the Word as very sacred, even. But for her, it's also transportable. So, uh, Anyway, I'm going to turn this over to Nellie. I'm happy to answer questions at the I end. Have, and, yes? I just have one question. I'm like, sure. just more a casual reader of Emily Dixon than Lover. But what I can never understand, and maybe scholars did, here's a woman who essentially is a recluse. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. But, but she's, you know, inside, you know, confines for most of the time. And very few people, you know, see and talk to her over years compared to, but yet it seems counterintuitive how she writes about things that are so outside of her, you know, narrow universe. I mean, it seems counterintuitive that this could happen. Well, and one of the things you should know, and this is what a lot of my work has been on and is on, yeah. is that, oh, okay, is that she was not as reclusive as the legends attached to her. And something, one of the ways to think about it is Higginson and Mabel Lemus Todd, she never met Mabel Lemus Todd, by the way, ever. Never met her face to face. Anyway, um, they're trying to package and sell a new poet, okay? And let me think of an analogy. We have a composite biography of rock stars, right? Especially if you think back to, say, the 60s. Long hair, they're probably dressed provocatively in some ways, you know. We'll be seeing a lot about the Beatles first being on Ed Sullivan over the next few months. Um, and what else? Sex and drugs. That's a composite biography that may or may not 
apply to Bruce Springsteen or whomever. Mm -hmm. Similarly, people who were readers at the end of the 19th century <coughs> had a composite biography of a woman poet. And guess what she looked like? She wore white, she was probably reclusive, and she was probably writing because she had her heart broken. Now, Emily Dickinson was a human, so I'm sure she had her heart broken. She was alive. I don't think that's why she wrote her poetry. She, as I, she, I'm learning that she was seeing people more and more as time went on. And she also, well, that's the main thing. She saw a lot of people. I think that she went through all of the great dramas of life. You know, one of the things she had to deal with was her first cousin fought for the Confederacy. That caused quite a family rift because her, her family, especially Susan Dickinson, were abolitionists. Her father was more a separatist, but he thought, all the slaves should be free. So I hope that answered your questions. Yes, very, very well. Yeah. Yeah. We're now going to hear from Nellie Lambert. And I think uh, Nellie's also going to talk to us about Emily, a little bit about Emily Dixon as a cook. Is that right? Oh, no? I'll, I'll, I'll leave that in. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So I think well, they I both, cookies. both humor and cooking. So please welcome my Nellie Lambert. <laughs> To, um, I still don't really believe that I'm a co-panelist. <laughs> Martha Nell Smith. Um, and thank you for including me. Can you hear me? Is, that, is this okay? Okay. Um, I, I try to see you. That might help me see you. <laughs> so, um, I came to the topic of humor in Emily Dickinson um, in a roundabout way. I liked Emily Dickinson as a poet when I was in high school and college, but she didn't. I didn't really understand her, and humor was was the key to my understanding what she was doing. And then I was really surprised to discover so it was sort of the opposite journey um, that Martha Nell described. I was surprised to discover that there was only one book, really, one full-length study of humor in Dickinson. This is Martha Nell Smith's comic power in Emily Dickinson, and that really surprised me because it seemed that it was one of the key elements to understanding what she was offering in her poetry. Um, I worked on what I call broad-minded humor in Emily Dickinson's poetry, and broad-minded humor was her ability to grasp something that was simultaneously reaching towards the depths of painful experiences or um, intense experiences, and on the other hand, um, a, an understanding of the levity in all experience, and that these two things were happening simultaneously. And I thought that her humor showed how deeply invested she was in the world and in people, and also how disinterested she was, how detached apart, and that those two things were happening at the same time. So I looked at it in my work, um, sort of from a philosophical perspective. Now, um, when I came across, and this relates to the baking, so I'll speak about that first. When I came across, when I was studying her biographies and came across her, um, her prowess as a baker, this um, underlined for me what Martha Nell has already been saying, which is that the, the popular icon of the shy, fragile, um, uh, fearful personality was just simply untrue. And I think anyone who's spent time with her letters um, can't deny that. That when you, when you see the, the mischief and the play in almost every single letter she ever wrote, um, it's, it's, it's hard to reconcile that with this popular icon. And her baking is a, is a wonderful example of that because it shows how, just as she wrote thousands of letters, it shows how she was always reaching out to people. The purpose of the baking was to be sent as gifts to loved ones. And it was, um, and she also sent flowers and she sent her poetry. And these were, these were all ways in which she contained her love for people. So much of her work was actually spent reaching out to people. And so again, that 
it doesn't really match this idea that she needed to be alone. Um, that her, her work was, was highly concentrated, but it involved reaching out to others. Um, so I have a list for you of different kinds of humor that's really just kind of a, an overview. And it's not exhaustive. It's, uh, there are many, many more kinds of humor in her work. And it's not, um, these aren't categories that are, are self-contained, they overlap. And the names are sort of just markers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them labels did of you, these kinds of humor. Yeah, it should be. Everybody has one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's the next. Um, Here's the next. Oh, I can use I would just say that the connection between um, a, a sort of broad connection between what I see happening in her baking and what I see happening in the humor in her poetry is um, that humor makes very difficult truths in her poetry more palatable. It makes them um, um, not necessarily more understandable right away, but sweeter. And uh, similar, and, and I see her uh, liking sweet treats, liking baking, um, be because she likes to offer sweetness to those around her. And I don't think of that as a, a, a sort of weak, cliché, uh, domestic habit for her. I think it was it, it was more tied into her her life's work. Um, so here's just a, a, a cursory list. Um, there's kind of the classic wit, and these might be examples you're more familiar with that you might see. Um, you see Dorothy Parker develop this style much later with, with more cynicism. And um, you, you see it a little bit in Dickinson, and these little quips are well known. So faith is a fine invention for gentlemen who see but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. Um, and so that's the, the humor that's often cited. And it's a little bit more complicated in the poem on To Your Right, where she's got a pun um, on, on the word graves, and she puns on the name graves when she writes to her, is it her cousin, Joan Graves? Yeah. And, and yeah, you mentioned that cartoon image of a grave mm -hmm. that she includes on that letter. So she has a play on the name Graves, and then this poem, We do not play on, on graves because there isn't room. Besides, it isn't even, it slants, and people come. And the tendency in her, her poems that have anything to do with the topic of death is to think that we, we immediately need to be somber. And here she, she explains that um, somberness surrounding death is really just a matter of... Um, Architecture is just a matter of of, of how you, you can't you can't play on graves, um, and so you have to you have to stand at a distance. She goes on to say, um, so that's part of how she her she uses puns and wit. The next category is I'm calling cuteness. It's really an inadequate name, um, and I I worked on humor in her insect poetry. Um, and it, it seems arbitrary, but it, it seemed to me a way in, actually, to um, how she was grappling with some spiritual questions in her work. Some complex spiritual questions are expressed um, through um, the habits of bees and butterflies and flies. Um, and she uses their apparent diminutiveness and apparent cuteness to um, to speak about the, the beauty of their um, their one pointed focus on nectar or their one pointed focus on beauty um, and uh, and there's a lot of, of other stuff going on too but this one is an example of a drunken fly <laughs> who um, is compared to the bee at the end who really knows how to hold his liquor 
And then this more famous poem is um, in, in a letter form, is a letter from a fly to a bee. Bee, I'm expecting you, was saying yesterday to somebody you knew that you were due. The frogs got home last week, are settled in at work, birds mostly back, the clover warm and thick. You'll get my letter by the 17th. Reply, or better, be with me, yours. <laughs> Fly. <laughs> so she plays on, on the bee's name, which she does constantly, the bee as embodying existence. Um, and then this is just the beginning of what's known as her outhouse poem, about being in an outhouse and uh, alone and in a circumstance, reluctant to be told, a spider on my reticence, assiduously crawled. And um, it, it actually becomes a really, really wonderful, com complicated poem. Um, but there, there are so many of these. Um, I'm, I'll just sort of summarize the next section because we don't have a way for me to show you. But um, there's a video footage of Gary Kinsler who seems to, he reads um, some of the humor in her early letters very well. Some, uh, the poem that I just read, We Do Not Play on Graves, he also missed the humor in that. I was very surprised in the video <laughs> clip. He read it, um, Garrison Keeler, who who seemed to understand her humor in other ways, um, felt that this was this was a you know definitely a poem about grieving. Um, but he he reads poems from when she's about 12 years old, poems to Austin, which where she has these uh, meandering subjects about chickens getting their heads cut off, and she's constantly. Um, ending the letter and then starting it again. I have nothing more to say, and then she thinks of something else to say. And there's a letter, um, I think it was to Susan Dickinson, where she's describing the sermon. Yes. And, um, and she's describing how this, the, the, the priest is going on and on about the sermon. And meanwhile, she's deciding, am I going to wear the blue dress or the brown dress tomorrow? And she has this, you see kind of her stream of consciousness and, and, her, and her humor, her, um, her irreverent humor. Um, this next section is just uh, another example of the play in her manuscripts um, in, on the level of her variants, which if you go to um, Martha Nelson's site, um, emilyvinson.org, you'll get a taste of what that looks like. It's so fun to look at her manuscripts. These plus marks next to words indicate um, where she included um, a variant word, and there's a lot of wonderful scholarship about how we're meant to read this. I think this is a fun example because um, this is her bees are black with gilts or singles. Her variant for fracture in the poem is rapture. And it, it, they rhyme with each other, but with nothing, no other word in the poem. And so she has this little play um, in, on the, in the margins, kind of a, this persona in the margins that is um, it is kind of a, a, an interactive audience measure in the poem. Um, <coughs> now, the most interesting humor to me became actually the humor that I found in her poetry about death. Um, and it was, again, speaking to this cliche of, of the somber, death-focused Emily Dickinson. And I found it in poems that are more noticeably funny right away, and in poems that, um, that no one, including me, ever thought would be funny at first, but I started to see that she was using the same devices. Um, one category I'm calling body-related humor about death, and um, it actually, inspired by Martha Nell's work on cartooning, um, you see it as um, images that if you are to visualize them, they're like, it's like cartoon physics. If you're to visualize what's happening with the body in the poem, and um, if you were to draw it, it would be hilarious. <laughs> so here's one example. We grow accustomed to the dark when light is put away. When you read those first two lines, you think, this is, this is going to be bleak. <laughs> and, um, and the poem sort of continues that way in that tone for a few more stanzas. And then when you get to the stanza that I have in bold, the bravest grope a little and sometimes hit a tree directly in the forehead. That if you, if you, um, if you haven't been um, carried away by feeling that this is a bleak poem, 
you actually visualize that, it's very funny. <laughs> and this next poem is um, her poem, I Am Alive, I Guess. And I tried to act, to actually act out the different motions in this poem. And I thought, and I saw how funny it was, it's this speaker who's <coughs> trying to get empirical evidence that she's alive, but scientific proof that um, the carmine tingles warm at her fingertips. So there's blood at her fingertips that if I hold a glass against my breath, it blurs it. Physician's proof of breath. Um, I am alive because I am not in a room, the parlor, commonly it is. So visitors may come and lean and view it sidewise and say how cold it grew. <laughs> And was it conscious when it stepped in immortality? That's one of her euphemisms for death. She has many. Um, so, so I saw this a hilarious um, activity that the speaker was involved with, trying to to prove that she was physically alive, and then showing at, towards the end of the poem that that was less important than being alive in some other way. Um, Now this poem, you, you may not leave the room feeling convinced that this poem has anything funny in it, after great pain, <laughs> formal feeling that. Um, uh, one of my committee members um, debated with me on it, and then after, our, after my two fans, he's, he said, okay, you, you, I'm, I'm convinced. You convinced me there's something funny in that poem, I'm convinced. <laughs> Emily Dickinson had, was a humorous poet. And what it is is this is this cartoon sort of cartoon physics that if you look at how she's using metonyms, so she's using parts of the body almost almost as though they're disembodied. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. If you were to draw that nerves sitting in pews <laughs> um, at a funeral or something, looking like tombs, it's, it would be a funny cartoon. The stiff heart, a, a disembodied heart, walking around like hands questioning. Um, the feet, disembodied feet, mechanical around. So I started to think of her metonyms that way and, and saw this, um, that on the one hand she's describing something, uh, she's describing a, a feeling that is reaching very deeply in the other direction. And on the other hand, that um, the intensity of that has this, this comic element at the same time. I thought I would just include for you this comic strip that a friend found for me, um, had sent me, and it's uh, meant to be a version of Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Um, he kindly stopped for me, and I actually thought the comic strip understood something about that poem really nicely, and the, <laughs> that it works like a it comic does. strip, mm -hmm. and that in, um, in the, the last part of the poem, the death sort of does hijack the carriage and, and leave the speaker all alone. Um, is that not her car? No, it's not her. It was just a, a playful website. Um, yeah, she does. Here we just see her, no, no outfit, just the bun to, to indicate Emily Dickinson. Um, the, the kind of humor that I find so fun in her work is her use of understatement. And I, I would say her wry use of understatement. And also her use of abrupt, abrupt shifts. This example that I've included for you is the understatement. I, I also sometimes call it her evil humor. Um, her humor when she um, to seems to be totally unfazed by the patterns of life, which include death. Um, and so here it's, it's easy to invent a life. God does it every day. Um, and then later, it's easy to efface it. The thrifty deity could scarce afford eternity to spontaneity. Um, and then at the end of the poem, um, th this, uh, his perturbless plan, inserting here a son, there leaving out a man. So that she's, she's almost um, so broadly detached from the, the phenomenon of death. Um, isn't it cynicism? Um, I think it's not cynicism. It's not cynicism um, because it's it's what I would call looking at it from a very broad perspective, and it's not quite cynicism. And I I have trouble looking.
looking at her poems in isolation. I see them, I see her poetry in dialogue, poems in dialogue with other poems. And, you know, I understand her use of words because she uses it in her letters in a certain way. And so when you see her, she has this poem, but then she also has po poetry that shows how um, profoundly sensitive she is to her own suffering, to the suffering of others. So um, I see all of these poems working together. And for that reason, I don't think, I don't think it's um, the The abrupt shifts, I haven't included an example for you. You can see in poems, um, for example, she has a poem that says, I, I can wade grief, hold pools of it, but the least push of joy. Um, I flip up my heels and, and tip drunk in. And then there's a, a shift in the poem. It's almost like haiku. And she changes images entirely. She changes subject matter entirely. It's almost as though the speaker um, is drunk and went into a different image. And that's it's a kind of humor that doesn't make you laugh, but it's a kind of play in the poetry that's, um, that's unique to Emily Dickinson, I think. The humor in her letters about death um, here's an example, a letter to her friends, the Hollands, and probably 1878. She begins with this list of um, sad occurrences. Good night, I can't stay any longer in a world of death. Austin, that's her brother, is ill of fever. I buried my garden last week. Our man Dick lost a little girl through scarlet fever. I thought perhaps that you were dead, and not knowing the sexton's address, interrogate the daisies. So she, uh, she's, she's, I think she's doing two things in that list. On the one hand, she's making this list that, that seems sort of dismal, um, lighter, with that joke at the end. And on the other hand, she's, she's making a comparison between death and um, not hearing from someone. The, the absence of a friend is equatable to, to death, and that's, uh, on another level, interesting to me. In, in her letters to Went Thomas Wentworth Higginson during the Civil War, um, in 1863, she wrote, she was a prolific letter writer. In 1863, she wrote um, more poems than any other year, I think. Um, is that right? Well, she copied them. She copied when them they were year. written that year. Is. Okay. Hmm. okay. Currently dated. But she wrote, um, I think, only five letters that year. She wrote very few letters, and um, a few of them were to um, Higginson, and then to her, to Louisa and Fanny. Um, and in her letters to Higginson, at this point, she's not yet met him, and um, she's uh, making jokes about death. He's off at war. And um, she says, for example, in the second line, and I have a typo, it's, I should have liked to see you before you became improbable. That's what it should say. So another one of her euphemisms for death. And then further down, um, um, toward the bottom, but I fear I detain you. Should you, before this reaches you, experience immortality, who will inform me of the exchange? Could you with honor avoid death? I entreat you, sir. I would bereave. Your gnome, and that's one of her, um, her her mock attempts to seem small in her letters to him. Um, and then I trust the profession, procession of flowers was not a premonition. This was a, referring to something that he had written. Um, but um, but again, these jokes about his death, which is which could easily happen at any moment. And um, in her letters to him, there's this element of shock at what she's willing to say um, uh, on the topic of death. Uh, she has a letter to him shortly after his child died that is almost to the effect of, get over it, this, um, in, in a sort of playful way. But you don't, you don't feel that it's cold or mean. There's something um, in, in the play and how she constructs the letter that's very warm. So I'll just leave you with this survey, and I've probably gone way over time. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, if uh, you would like to ask questions of our two uh, panelists, feel free to come on up afterwards. If anybody didn't 
sign the guest book, please do so. We get grants in part on how many people attend, and that's a way of recording attendance. So be sure and uh, sign the guest book. And uh, all these books here are free. If anybody wants those, take those. I'm a volunteer at WAMU, and when Diane Ream uh, doesn't use books, she gives them to the volunteers. So if anybody wants one of those books, take them. Uh, feel free. And uh, come back again. Uh, we're having a panel in January on ghost writers. Yes, very ghost good. Ghost writers. We're having some major ghost writers in America. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.